Uh, but um, it's so great to see each and every one of you. God is good all the time. All the time. He's so good. Oh, yeah. Uh, today's uh, sermon, I mean, scripture, comes from Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 through 17. And I'm just going to give you guys a heads up. It's not a very long sermon today. It's going to be short. Um, but I pray, Lord, um, I pray that even though it's short, that we will learn from it. I pray that the Holy Spirit will just open up our hearts and we will just receive the word of God. Um, I remember last week I talked about how we need to cherish the word. Um, because God's word is the truth, and it's the authority over our lives. And it's through his word that we get to know who God is. Um, it's through his word that we get to know his love for us. And it's through his word that we get to know um, his desires for us. Um, so today's word comes from Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 through 17. And I have it up on the screen. If you have your physical copy, that's great too. And I'll be reading the NIV version today. I know I usually read the ESV, but I like the NIV translation of uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 through 17. Um, and this is God's word. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Midi by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem will last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all of Israel, both near and far, and all the countries where you have scattered us because of, your, because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. Even though we have rebelled against him, we have not, we have not obeyed the, law, the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. We have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bring, bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written, just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come to us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning our sins and giving attention to your truth. So the Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought our people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, who, and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and our iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. In verse 17, now our God, hear the prayers and the petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate uh, sanctuary. This is, where, uh, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you once again uh, as your church as one body, as your sons and daughters, to be transformed by your word. And Lord, remind us, Lord, that your word is the truth. Um, it's your word that is the light onto our path. It's your word that shines in the darkness in this dark world. And it's your word that will stand forever. So, Lord, I pray, Lord, as this weak, humble servant of yours preaches today, Holy Spirit, that you will bless this time. Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord, every word that flows out of my mouth and my heart would be words of you. Lord, that we, I wouldn't rely on my own knowledge and my own flesh, but, Lord, that I rely on your spirit. 
your truth, and your grace, Lord. So we look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we find ourselves in the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 9. And I don't know if you guys remember, but I preached on Daniel uh, before. And I actually preached on Daniel chapter 6, I believe, is, which is where, um, uh, where Daniel is thrown into the lion's den because he disobeyed the law that um, I believe King Nebuchadnezzar passed, which is that no one should bow down and worship any god except for King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and something, just to refresh our minds a little bit, a little background on Daniel. Daniel was basically an Israelite. Um, and Israel, um, they have fallen to Babylon, uh, the Babylonian kingdom. And, and what we learn is that Daniel is taken into captivity at a very young age. Um, he's a lot younger than us. Um, he is kind of a young teenager. I would say about probably like 14 to 16 years old. And he's taken into captivity because what we see from the Bible, what God's word says about Daniel is that he was righteous. Um, he was different from everyone else. And not only that, he was super smart, super um, good at what he does. And, um, and he was a man that never compromised his faith in the Lord. No matter what happened to him, no matter what was in front of him, whether it was a problem, whether it was a fear, whether it was a worry, he never compromised his faith in the Lord. And we see that God blesses him. Um, we see that he's so good at his job that he gets invited to be the king's helper. And because he's so good at his job, later on, he becomes like second in command. And we see that jealousy rises between the other officials because they're like, why is this man who is a slave, who technically was a slave, why is he now in charge of us? And we see that they conspire together to get rid of Daniel, right? They, they make the king pass the law where you have to bow down to the king. That's the only thing you can bow down to. But Daniel's like, no, I'm not. Or, or that you can't pray. Right? But Daniel's like, I will never give up prayer. And we learned through Daniel chapter 6 that as Christians and as believers of Christ, we live by prayer. That prayer is our lifeline. That prayer is something that we're called to do. That Paul says in his word um, to, to uh, never stop praying. To pray without ceasing. Right? Which means to keep on praying. Because prayer is the most important thing as a believer it's through prayer that we get to communion with God. That's what prayer is, having communion with the Lord, um, knowing his heart and, uh, and, and knowing his desires for us and lifting our hearts to him. And we are actually now, we're going to kind of fast forward, and we are, but the story ends with Daniel getting thrown into the lion's den, but the Lord blesses Daniel and he kept him safe. safe. He gets thrown, uh, his friends get thrown into the furnace, right? The guards throw three of his friends, but one of the guards is like, hold on, we threw three, but why is there four? And that fourth was the angel of the Lord walking with his friends, protecting them, right? So we see that God blesses Daniel because he is righteous. And we find ourselves in uh, chapter 9 of uh, the book of Daniel. And the thing that I love about chapter 9, Daniel, uh, especially verses 1 through 17, is because it's one of the most passionate prayers that you can find in the Bible. Um, and today we're going to look at this passionate prayer by Daniel, because it really teaches us what we should do um, and what we should really pray about. You guys tracking with me, church? Now, I'm not saying that what you're praying is wrong. There's nothing wrong with your prayers. But Daniel is teaching us a different direction to head in when we pray. And before we go into prayer, um, this prayer, we have to understand why Daniel is praying. You're tracking with me. Now, according to verse 2, Basically, Daniel understood uh, through the prophecy, through the prophet Jeremiah, that Jerusalem was going to be in desolation for 70 years. Now, do you guys know what desolation means? It means inhabitable, basically destroyed, no life, nothing. Um, and and it's, the desolation is going to last for 70 years. So understanding the situation that Jerusalem is in, Daniel, knowing that the only being that can truly save them is God, Daniel turns to the Lord in prayer. And from verses 4 to 17, we see this long and passionate prayer by Daniel. But church, the first thing we have to notice is how Daniel prepared himself to pray. If you look at verse 3, it says this, but he prepared himself, right? 
It says, so I turned to the Lord and God, God and pleaded with him prayer in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Right? Now, church, what is a sackcloth? I'm sorry? Yeah, basically. Right? It's, it, back in the day, they used sackcloth as clothing. And sackcloth was actually made um, from, like, animal hair. And it was a very inexpensive material. And people, uh, poorer people used it as, um, uh, as a garment, as a clothing. But actually, sackcloth uh, during this time it also had another meaning. Also, he, we see that he covered himself in ashes, and he also fasted. Now, sackcloth, like I said, it was a, it's an ordinary clothing used by people, uh, more of the poorer people. But eventually, it became associated with mourning and later sorrowful repentance. So a sackcloth symbolized repentance. And you know fasting, right? We know what fasting is. It's basically not eating. But it's not just not eating, right? During that fast, what do you do? You lift your heart to the Lord. You seek the Lord in prayer through repentance. So it was a form of repentance for God's people. And it was used as a spiritual tool to humble themselves before the living God, right? Now for us, the way Daniel prepared to pray, you know, getting the sackcloth, putting on ashes, and I hope you guys don't do that when you pray before the Lord, but putting on sackcloth, putting on ashes, and fasting, right? For us, it's kind of weird, right? We don't normally do that when we pray. What do we do? At most, we just bow our heads, right? Sometimes, if we're really desperate for the Lord, we go on our knees, and we seek the Lord, right? But what Daniel did here, this, this, this act of preparing the sackcloth, the ashes, and the fasting, it really showed Daniel's humility. It really showed his humble heart. We see that Daniel, you know, he even humbled himself even before he prayed to the Lord. Right? He prepared his heart even before he started his prayer. And church, I think this really teaches us that, you know, when we pray before the living God, the holy God, we should really consider the attitude of our heart. That we should always humble ourselves before God. And this also goes into when we even come to God in worship, I think. Especially when we come to worship services on Sundays, amen? Because you see, church, the most important thing is the posture of your heart. And what the Lord cares about the most is your heart. What he wants is your heart. You know, when you come to church on Sundays, what is our heart like, the condition of our heart? Do we come to service with a heart that's open to the Lord, or do we come to church with a heart that's closed? You know, what's the attitude of our hearts? Do we approach God in worship with a joyful heart, a heart that is yearning for him, or do we just approach Sunday service as, oh, man, it's just another Sunday service, right? Church, this is really important because maybe, maybe the Lord is trying to speak to you this Sunday and many of us can't hear him or feel his presence because our hearts are so hardened. And what's important is the condition of your heart. You know, Jesus says in his word that if you can't forgive your brothers or sisters, then you can't come before me. Right? If you're carrying all of these things in your heart, right, the Lord is saying you can't come before me, that I can't forgive you. And what's important is the posture, the condition of our heart. Some of us, you know, we go through the motions on Sundays. Right, man, man, like it's just another typical Sunday. I don't really think anything great is going to happen, but you never know. It could be that Sunday where the Lord is trying to speak to you and reveal himself to you, but you can't hear or feel his presence because your heart is in the wrong place. Maybe your heart is so hardened from an anger that you have towards your brother. Maybe your heart is so hardened because, I don't know, whatever it may be, right? How you approach God in prayer, how do you approach God in worship is so important. The posture of your heart. Amen? You know, that we shouldn't pray with God with this attitude of making demands and requests but we should be seeking the Lord with our hearts lifted to him 
ask in humility, right? Saying, Lord, I am nothing without you, right? And seeking the Lord in prayer, seeking the Lord in worship. You see, God is merciful and gracious to those who live in humility. And humility is what? The opposite of pride. Some of us, we can be really prideful, amen? But the Lord doesn't use the heart of the pride. He uses those who are humble. He uses those who are weak. He uses those who know that they're not righteous before the living God. Amen? Now, church, what type of prayer is Daniel praying? I want us to look at verse 4. And it says this. So I turned to the Lord and God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition. Uh, and fasting at verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Right? So what is Daniel's prayer? It's basically a confession prayer. He's not bringing any, he's not like, yeah, he's, bring, he's lifting his heart, but it's a, it's, a, it's a confession prayer. And what is confessing? What is he confessing? He's confessing his sins. Right? But is Daniel just confessing his sins? No. I want us to look at verses 5 and 6. <clears throat> it says this. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and we have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke to your name to our kings, our princes and our ancestors, and all of the people of the land. And if you read more, you see that there's a certain word that's being repeated. And what is that word? It starts right in the beginning of verse 5. We. Right? It says that we have sinned, we have done wrong. We have been wicked. We have turned away from your commands. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets. What do we see being repeated here? The word we. So what does that imply? Right? Daniel is not just confessing about his sins, but he's also praying and confessing on behalf of his people. Right? And I want us to think about this for a moment. If you think about it, why would Daniel include himself in this repentance prayer, right? Because the Bible teaches us that Daniel was righteous, right? That he was righteous from head to toe. <clears throat> and if you think about it, the desolation of Judah, Jerusalem, of Israel, it, 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 it's not really his fault. Like, he's this young boy. And usually it's like the older people that rebel. And, and it's so evident where we see where where God frees the Israelites from captivity in Egypt, right? They were captive for 400 years, right? And they prayed out to God saying, God, save us. And then God raises Moses as their leader. And through Moses, he frees the people of Israel. They get into the wilderness. And what did they do? They complain again. They're like, man, Moses, life in Egypt was so much better than this. I'm like, what? Like, you cried out to God to free you. He saves you. And now you're complaining to him. And you want to go back into slavery, right? And after that, they're in the wilderness for 40 years, and then God hears their prayers, and now it's time to enter into the promised land, right? And what did the people of Israel do? They disobey, and they don't listen to the Lord, and they don't enter into the promised land, except for two young boys, Joshua and Caleb, Right? And then the younger men, I think it was 20 years or younger, they were able to enter into the promised land, right? So when we see the disobedience of Israelites, it's usually like the older generation, right? So, so we see that, if you think about it, the, the, the fall of Judah, the fall of Jerusalem, Israel, wasn't really his fault, right? He, he was a very young kid when he was taken into cap captivity. He was just an adolescent. You know, the reason why Judah fell is because the people were disobedient, right? And the Bible teaches us that Daniel was righteous. He was honest and humble from head to toe. But yet he still included himself in that confession, saying that we have sinned. Daniel didn't say they have sinned, but he says we have sinned. We have disobeyed. And you see, church, although Daniel lived a righteous life, we see that he was ready to plead and include himself in the guilt of his community, his people, recognizing 
and no human is without sin. You see, and that's what's more important. And, and, and what's, I'm sorry, like Daniel, even though he was righteous, he knew that he himself was not perfect. He knew himself that even though I, I may be following the Lord and, and, and I'm living for him, I'm still prone to sin. Like I'm not prone to sin. Is that the right wording? Right? That I'm still a sinner. That I still fall short. So Daniel, what? <laughs> so Daniel knew that he himself, you know, I'm still a sinner. And he included in himself, and he recognize, he's recognizing that no human is without sin. And, we, and what we see, another thing about Daniel is that he really loved his people. He really loved his community. And you see, church, this teaches us that we should acknowledge, that we should acknowledge our own personal sins, but we also have to stand with our community, our church, our people, and we should compassionately identify with them as well. You see, church, we don't just pray for people, but we understand and we support them in their pain and in their sorrow and in their need. Amen? It's understanding that no human is without sin and that everyone needs grace upon their life. Amen? Yes, Daniel was righteous. Yes, Daniel stayed true to the Lord, and everyone around him fell away and disobeyed. But we still see that Daniel included himself in that prayer, saying that we have sinned, we have fallen short, we have disobeyed. Daniel still included himself in that repentance prayer because he knew himself that he was a sinner, that no one is righteous before the holy God. Amen. And you see, church, this ties into the love of God. You see, what sin does is that it separates us from God. You know, I, I talked about what sin does. It puts up this disguise, right? You know, and I compared it to, you know, Little Red Riding Hood where this wolf puts on the disguise of the grandma. And the, everything looks normal, right? Like, Little Red comes in. He's like, oh, right? Everything looks normal, right? But she's tricking Little Red into believing that he is the grandma. Why? Because he wants to devour her and eat her. I think another good fairy tale is Hansel and Gretel, right? You know the story of Hansel and Gretel, right? Where they're starving and they see the, the house that's made with all these treats. And the witch pretends to be this nice witch. Oh, come on in. Enjoy whatever you want. Right? Kids, if someone says that to you, go the other way. <laughs> right? But she invites them in. And she's, like, feeding them all these treats to get them fat and juicy, right, so she can eat them, pretending to be this nice grandma, but this grandma is a witch, right? And that's what sin does. Sin pretends to be, hey, hey, man, come here. It puts on this disguise, and it starts brainwashing you and saying, hey, isn't this fun? Everything is fine. I have all these things for you. Indulge in it, enjoy in it. Why do you want to live a life with God? Don't you already find happiness without him? That's what sin does. Sin separates us from God. And you see, church, the reason why Judah fell, the reason why Jerusalem is desolate is because the people of God have fallen away from him. They chose to disobey. They chose sin over God. And this really speaks to us, church, right? That if you see, like Daniel included everyone in that prayer, right? If you see a fellow Christian, a fellow believer, and you see that brother or sister that's caught up in sin, what do you think our responsibility is as Christians? It's to pray for them, right? To have compassion over them. You know, Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8, and he says this, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, listen to this, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Paul is basically saying, you know, praying isn't just about you. Yes, you have to pray for yourself. That's the most important thing to do. 
but it just doesn't stop there. You have to pray for others. Especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Especially our church members. Especially our community. You see, just how Daniel stood and identified with his people, we are too to call to confess and pray for others. Interceding on behalf of others. When you have a brother who is struggling in sin and he can't pray, pray for him. Amen? If you have a sister, a Christian sister that's struggling, and he's saying, man, I just can't pray, what is your job? Pray for her. Amen? It's about praying for others, interceding on behalf of others. You know, I hear this all the time. You know, when I'm going through something, all my friends will be like, at least I can pray for you. No, like that's the, the most thing you could do for me, praying for me. That's what I want. People say, that's the least I can do. No, that's the most you can do for me. Praying for me. Brothers and sisters, please pray for me. Amen? <laughs> I'll be praying for you guys as well. Right? We have to pray for others. To pray for all the Lord's people. Just how Daniel prayed for his people. He's saying, we have disobeyed, we have sinned. Lord, help us to turn back to you. And this also speaks into Daniel's greatest desire. And I pray that this will be our desire as well. The last thing we learn from Daniel is his desire. And what is Daniel's desire? That his people will turn to the Lord. And church, this should be our desire as well, amen? That the people around us, our family, our friends, our coworkers, our classmates, etc. right, the list can go on, that they would desire the Lord. Amen? Just how you experience the goodness of the Lord, you, we, we sang it today, right? Good, good Father, it's who you are. You are good, not because of the good things you do, but that's just who you are. You are good. You are perfect in all of your ways. I've experienced your love, and it's your love that transformed me Right? And our desire should be that I want my people, the people around me, to experience that as well. I want my friends. I want my family. Some of us, we have family members who don't know Christ, right? Some of us, we have friends, even our best friends that don't know Christ. We have coworkers that we're really close with that don't know Christ. We have classmates that, that we always talk to at school that don't know Christ. That they, too, will experience the love of God, the goodness of God, and that they will turn to the Lord. Amen. That should be our desire. That they would experience the love of Christ and be transformed by the love of Christ. Right? But it starts by us actually bringing the gospel wherever we go. Church, we live in a world that goes against the teachings of God. We live in such a cold and broken world that goes against the teachings of Christ Jesus, the love of God, and it's so evident, statistically, people are falling away from the church. Christianity is dropping. Churches are closing their doors because people are just leaving. So what that means is that people aren't coming to church. So if people aren't coming to church, how are they going to hear the gospel? Right? It's us bringing the gospel outside of the church walls. And bringing it wherever we go. Now, I'm not saying to be like, hey, you know Jesus Christ. Like, don't do that. That's, not, that's weird, right? But we have the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Jesus gave us the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we get to spread the gospel. Amen? Right? No, that's when we come in. If churches are closing, if people are falling away from the church, if people aren't coming to church, that's when we come in. We are called to bring the gospel and the love of Christ wherever we go. You see, Jesus gave us this great commission, which is to preach the gospel and to spread his love. In other words, we're called to be evangelists. We're called to be missionaries. Now, I'm not saying you have to give up your whole life and then go live in Guam and, and be a missionary. I'm not saying do all that. That's a little too extreme. But if the Lord is calling you to do that, to take that leap of faith and go, all right? But I'm not saying you have to give up your whole career like Levi, where right? Jesus said, follow me, and Levi literally left everything behind, right? But if you believe the Lord is calling you to do that, then 
by all means, take that leap of faith and go for it. Right? But I'm not asking you to do that. But wherever you're at, that is the mission field. Amen? Your home, your family, your friends who do not know Christ, our workplace. I know preaching the gospel is shunned upon at work. It's not allowed. But I'm not saying you have to preach the gospel to them. But it's sharing the love of Christ with your coworkers, right? Your school, your neighborhood, your community, right? That is the mission field, amen? And as Christians, as disciples of Christ, we are called to bring the gospel wherever we go, to spread the love of Christ wherever we go. And my prayer for us, church, is that all of us would have a heart like Daniel, a heart that recognizes that I am a sinner, that I am not righteous, a heart that recognizes the hurt and the pain of his community and prays for his people, and a heart that desires the Lord and a heart that desires people to turn to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this time you have given us And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that through your word, through Daniel, that you're teaching us a lot, Lord. You're teaching us the heart that we should have, a heart that yearns for you, a heart that is calling out to you, a heart that is humble, a heart that recognizes that I am a sinner, and a heart that prays for others. Lord, how we admit it, praying for others is so hard because sometimes we even find it so hard to pray for ourselves. But Lord, I pray, Lord, that we will learn from the life of Daniel that you have called us to pray for your people. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 to pray for all the Lord's people. Lord, we live in a dark and cruel world, a chaotic, broken world, goes against your teachings, and that goes against Christianity, that goes against your word. Lord, people are falling away from the church. People are turning away from the gospel. Those people, they don't have a chance to hear the gospel because they're not coming here. But Lord, you have called us to be evangelists. You have called us to be the salt and light. You have called us to be missionaries, to bring the gospel wherever we go to our schools, to our workplaces, to our families. Lord, we have experienced your goodness. And Lord, we desire that the people around us will experience it as well. Lord, you are so good. You are so perfect in all of your ways. And help us to share that with others. Lord, if we don't share it, then you know we're selfish, holding that to all to ourselves the goodness of who you are. So help us to share it with others. Help us to love others. Help us to lift others in prayer, to intercede on behalf of others. We look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.